Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my backyard. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make one of these presses as well as all the accessories needed to press your own apples right in your own backyard. So let's get started by making the press. Since I didn't have any 16 quarter or 4 inch thick white oak, I'm going to be gluing up parts for the press from 8 quarter stock. These three boards all came from the same tree and the two on the left are sequentially cut, so I'll be able to show a few different techniques for disguising the glue lines. I'm starting with the uprights since those are the longest. The board on the left will give me three of them and I'll cut a section out of the boards on the right to give me the fourth. I'll cross cut the boards to a more manageable length and then use the bandsaw to rip each upright section out of the boards. I also labeled these as I went to keep the pairs matched up. One face gets flattened on the jointer and an edge squared up. The boards then get run through the planer to clean up the opposite face. I didn't plane these all to the same thickness, I only planed them enough to get the other face cleaned up. At this point I'm trying to maintain as much thickness as I can, since I'll be remilling all the parts once they are all glued up. The first glue up example here is the best case scenario. These are sequentially cut, so the grain on the edge continues across the glue line. The next example is a book match. This provides a hidden glue seam on one of the edges. And the last example is an end-to-end -end slip. This helps to hide the seam since the growth rings on both boards have the same orientation, which means the green will look similar along the edges and should blend together well. Another tip for gluing up stock this way is to have straight grain along the edges. It's always easier to hide a glue seam when the grain is straight. This is also a common tip for panel glue ups. I did the same thing to create all the stock for the rest of the pieces of the press. Once the glue is dry, I'll mill all the parts flat and square on the jointer and run the other two faces through the planer at the same thickness setting to end up with square stock. All the parts can then be cross cut to length, starting by squaring and cleaning up one end of each piece, and then a stop lock can be used to set the final length of all similar parts. Now for some joinery. I'll start by cutting the notches in the upright to receive the upper beam. The distance this starts from the top will determine the shear strength of the press. Here I'm leaving an inch and a half, which is a lot stronger than I thought it would be. However, through some destructive testing, I'd recommend leaving more material here, but more on that later. I'll use a stop block to set the distance down from the top so each notch will be in the same position. Then I'll remove almost all the waste and use a stop block to cut the bottom so the beam fits snugly into the notch. The notches for the lower beams are cut in a similar way. Last up are the tendons on the bottom of the uprights. A stop block can be used here again to make sure all the cuts are in the same location all the way around the upright and from one upright to the next. Next, the underside of the top beam receives a mortise for a stainless steel plate that the bottle jack will press against. This just protects the wood from becoming dented. I use a piece of stainless steel that I drilled and countersunk screw holes into. Onto the feet. These receive a decorative chamfer on the ends and a relief cut along the bottom. At this point, it's much easier to go ahead and sand and finish everything. I used General Finish's salable finish for this, and I made sure to get finish into all the notches so those areas would be sealed. Time to start on the assembly. I made a couple of hole location templates, one for the upper beam and one for the lower beam area. The holes get drilled through with a half inch drill bit and the holes are enlarged to 5 eighths of an inch on all parts except for the part contacting the head of the bolt. On these parts, a square mortise is cut to give somewhere for the underside of the carriage bolt head to go. The parts on the back side receive a 1 and 3 eighths inch counterbore to receive the washer and nut. The feet get these drilled before the mortises are cut into them. The wall thickness gets a bit thin, which could cause some blowout if drilled afterwards. To cut the mortises into the feet, I first drilled out the majority of the waste with the drill press, and then used a router with an edge guide to clean it up. Next, the press can be assembled and the bolts installed.
and last of the feet can be installed and pinned with a bolt. Back to the sheer strength and destructive testing of the press. This did hold up really well. You can see how much force this 12 ton bottle jack is applying based on how hard the handle is being pushed. There it goes. <laughs> the repair is pretty simple, some glue to reattach the piece that sheared off. And now to actually make this stronger, I'm going to install some dowels which have a really high shear strength. If you're making your own, definitely extend the area above the beam. And if you really want to, you can add some dowels that'll give you even more strength. So the first accessory that we're going to make is the tray. This sits in the bottom of the press and it collects all the juice from the apples as they're pressed and directs them into a bucket through the spout in the front. So let me show you how that's made. The base of the tray is made from marine plywood that I painted tan so it would somewhat match the white oak. The angle front of the tray is laid out and I'll cut along the line with a track saw. I have two pieces stacked together so I can make two trays at once. To make the walls of the tray, I milled up some more white oak and started cutting the pieces to length, working my way from the front to the back. I also added a few dominoes to help align and strengthen the joints. At the front of the tray, I'm going to install a plastic drain. The drain has a lip that I'll countersink and I'll also need a through hole for the spout to pass through. The frame gets glued to the plywood base with epoxy, and I'll also epoxy in the drain into the hole. The tray gets finished with the bar top epoxy to both protect it and make it watertight. So next let me show you how to make these lattices, or in this case they're called racks. And these go between each layer of apples and allow the juice to flow out from between those layers and collect down into the tray. I'll start by making the strips. I want straight grain for these, so I've laid out what I can use onto this board. Just for reference, this board yields enough strips to produce three lattices. The strips are going to be an inch and an eighth wide, which is wider than the thickness of the board, so I'm ripping the boards into roughly inch and a quarter strips, which will then get milled down to the width needed. I face jointed and squared up an edge of each of these. I'll rip a strip on the bandsaw and bring the board back to the jointer to joint the edge after each cut. The strips can then be planed down to the inch and one eighth thickness that I wanted. I'm leaving the fourth face rough since it'll be the waist side. I set the table saw to rip these down to quarter inch thick. Each of these strips gave me three of these quarter inch thick strips. Next I'm going to make a jig to hold all the strips in position so they can be easily glued up. I made a template of the lattice pattern with the center of each gap marked. I transferred that mark to a piece of melamine. I stuck a second piece of melamine to the first and drilled quarter inch holes at each mark. I set the depth stop on my drill press to drill all the way through the top piece and about a half inch into the bottom. Each hole receives a short piece of dowel. One end is chamfered to make insertion into the hole at the base easier and the other end is sharpened to make install in the top of the form easier. All of these alignment pins are not completely necessary but it does make it really easy to see where to apply glue. The first layer of strips can be laid down. Glue can be applied at the intersection points. The perpendicular strips can then be dropped in and the top of the jig can be installed. Since the press is already assembled, we can use the press itself to clamp this thing up. Once the glue is dry, the lattice can be trimmed up and cut the final size, sanded, and a finish can be applied. I use salable finish on these as well. Now 
Next I'll show you how to make the form. This is used to form the apples into shape and then once the apples are in shape, you remove the form and move on. The forms are just frames that are used to shape the apples for pressing and then are removed. The joinery here can be utilitarian or decorative or anywhere in between. I chose to use box joints here, mostly for their looks, but I figured this would be a good time to try them out. Now that's just about it, but you're going to need a couple of other things. First, you're going to need a top plate, which is just a board, a solid board that is roughly the same size as your forms. And this will go on top of the top layer of apples and press them down. And lastly, you're going to need a, uh, like a press block. And this is just a thicker piece of wood that distributes the force from the jack down through the whole assembly of stuff. And here, all I did for that was just glue three pieces of thinner material together just to get one big block. So if you want to see this thing in use, check out my other video where we pressed six bushels of apples with this thing, and that turned out really nicely. If you want to make your own, I'll have plans available as well, so check down in the description for a link to those. So thank you as always for watching, I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the press or anything back in my shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking.